Andy Yan, and I'm the director of the City Program here at Simon Fraser University. And I'd like to welcome you to our first talk of the year on the future of mobility with Tim Papandreou. And I'd like to begin with the acknowledgement that this e event is being held on the unceded indigenous land belonging to the Coast Salish people, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatouf nations. I'd like to also recognize the generous sponsors for tonight's events, TransLink, the city of Surrey, and the city of Vancouver. And I think tonight really in one way kind of culminates really um, recent events that I've had in terms of the future of mobility. And in that discussion of the future of mobility, of course, is if you'd like to kind of stay in touch with the city program, we're, we're pop into sfu.ca slash city. That really it's an event that I think really culminates actually a recent trip I had in Detroit in where uh, the conference that I was attending was addressed by a, uh, by, by a CEO of a car company talking about how its future is culminating in a triple zero vision, that it's going to be a future for mobility that is going to be zero emissions, uh, vision zero, that is a s transportation system with no fatalities or serious injuries involving traffic, and perhaps someday zero drivers. And it's in that environment, it was interesting to figure out which company this, uh, this particular um, CEO was in charge. Um, one would think it might be Elon Musk from Tesla, but no, it was actually Mary Barra, from the CEO of General Motors. As the conference kind of went on forward, it was actually coming down to this conversation of how General Motors might even someday move in towards the initials GM standing for general mobility. And this is indeed the same company that was either both wrongly or rightfully incriminated in the great streetcar conspiracy from the 1930s to the 1950s, two, killed the electric car in the 1990s, three, facing the revenge of the electric car in the aughts to the present, and is, quite interestingly today, facing and, and trying to be en route to becoming a company of the electric car amongst many other modes of transportation. So these are perhaps strange and exciting times indeed for mobility. And I'd like to, at this point, uh, hand over the dais to Jen St. Denis, the city politics and housing reporter for Star Vancouver. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We have this packed agenda tonight, so I'm just going to go through it all um, just to let you know what's going to be happening. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is this federal government uh, smackdown. The federal government is making cities compete against each other, which seems kind of mean, uh, for this special funding, and uh, there's it's to create a smarter cities. Uh, and what that means uh, are Joanna Clark and um, Doug McLeod are going to be telling us that. So that's going to be the first part. Um, and then we're going to hear from Kevin Desmond. He's the CEO of TransLink. Uh, there's going to be an exciting video at some point. Um, and then our feature speaker, Tim Papandreou, is going to take the stage and um, talk to us all about self-driving cars and exciting futures and what it means for transit. Um, so the first people to come up are going to be Joanna and Doug. Please come up and tell us what exactly are smart cities? Hi everyone, this is a packed crowd. I think I, we see some familiar faces out there and this is very exciting to embark on this journey for this uh, smackdown, but in our case, smack together because Surrey and Vancouver are putting in a, a joint proposal for the Smart Cities Challenge. So how many of you know what the Smart Cities Challenge is? Okay, so we can go. Yeah, we can. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't, in 2017, the federal government, through Infrastructure Canada, launched the Smart Cities Challenge. This competition challenges municipalities to address local issues through, through the use of data and technology. Through this initiative, the cities of Vancouver and Surrey have the opportunity to design the future of smart and safe urban mobility. We are among the five finalists in the large city category vying for single national prize of 50 million. 
We are now in the process of composing our final application due March 5th, 2019. So I encourage everyone to learn more about this project. We are going to be going through this fairly quickly, but there's a lot of information on the smartertogether.ca website. So it is important to emphasize that smart cities is not only about technology, but people, collaboration, and how we can improve the quality of life by utilizing the digital technology that we experience every day. So while Vancouver and Surrey's proposal focuses on mobility, other cities' challenges focused on empowerment and inclusion, environmental quality, and food security. And I think we can say that mobility also is cross-country cutting across those areas. So how did we get, how did we get started on this challenge? Surrey and Vancouver are the most populated cities in the region and therefore the province. And we share like-minded digital strategies as well as work plans to address future mobility. So since collaboration was a key focus for this challenge, it made sense to apply together. How did we choose mobility? We started engaging with our respective communities before the before the, just, be, just after the competition was an, announced. And we embarked on, a, on an extensive online and in-person engagement strategy to ensure that we could, we could hear from as many as people as possible to figure out what, how, what we needed to be addressed. What is, what is the biggest challenge we need to be looking at? And as a, uh, we heard loud and clear from the community that mobility is a key challenge area. So this is some examples of some of the work that we did, some of the engagement. And then as part of that, we did uh, an extensive um, innovation call. And these are some examples of what we heard. And I, I don't know if you guys can see, but we've got uh, Bring Back Interurban Rail, um, Gamify Moby Bikes, so riders help restock full or empty bike stations, sensors pr for pedestrians at street intersections, Traffic drones, drones during road accidents, and uh, tap payment or automatic billing for parking meters. So these are some, just some of the many, many, many ideas that are out there that for what we can do with digital technology, or maybe in the case of interurban rail, go back in time. Um, <laughs> and uh, basically, what we put together is a result of what we heard is this challenge statement. So the challenge statement uh, is what the Infrastructure Canada requested of us. It had to be 50 words, and hopefully this kind of summarizes what, what our proposal is. So Surrey and Vancouver, Surrey and Vancouver will implement Canada's first two collision-free multimodal transportation corridors, leveraging autonomous vehicles and smart technologies to demonstrate the path to safer, and that's a key word, healthier and more socially connected communities while reducing emissions, improving transportation efficiency, and enhancing livability in the face of rapid growth and traffic congestion. And just so you know, after congestion, that's 48 words, so we put in smarter together, just to add the 50. So I'm just gonna head it over to Doug. Thanks, Joanna. So now that we have a mission statement, now we figured, how are we going to achieve this? What is our pathway to success to actually um, developing these corridors? So we're looking at the different solutions that we have to, to, to ultimately implement a plan. So we said, we've got all this feedback from the public and we've got all this feedback from the, the vendors. How can we disseminate this? Well, what we decided is that we needed to develop four main themes and categories that we were getting from all this information to help develop our action plan. So the first category was enhancing the user experience. It's key. Every trip starts off as a walk trip. So of course you have to enhance that user experience. You have to make sure that people are happy and wanting to get out and about. And then having broader mobility solutions was key. And the enhanced user experience could also include things like wayfinding technology, shared mobility like um, bike share and um, scooter share um, that would ultimately enhance all the safety and accessibility throughout um, our, both our, our projects and then obviously making cycling, walking, and transit a very attractive solution. So then said, okay, well now that we're gonna enhance the user experience, what do we need to do this? Well, we need the smart mobility infrastructure. We need the sensors in place in traffic signals, um, uh, street lights, 
even embedded in our pavement and crosswalks, they're gonna help generate all the data for things like mobility apps, for safety applications, for um, automated detection, um, and even uh, making changes into our traffic signal timing. So then now we have all this data, now we're next, what do we do with all the data? Advanced data analytics. Smart solutions are grounded in data. So if we're generating all this amazing data, we've gotta do something with it. We've gotta analyze it and synthesize it from all the different sources around the, um, that are available to help produce machine learning that will help understand and anticipate future needs. Um, it'll help inform new corridor design, changes to traffic signals, and ultimately help connect autonomous shuttles. Autonomous shuttles would be the final category that would help us understand how we can use them and apply them in the city and the region. And having all this, the advanced data and the smart mobility infrastructure would enable the communication between the vehicles and sensors. And ultimately, AV shuttles can help um, eliminate human error and all the collisions and achieve our vision zero results. So now that we've divided all the categories and we figured out, okay, here we're, we're on our way to a plan, what is our actual plan? So now we're going to introduce the corridors that we're proposing for the challenge. And we'll start with uh, the City of Vancouver's corridor. Uh, it's the South Falls Creek Innovation Corridor. How many of you recognize where this is? Great, okay, so as you can see, it connects Granville Island to Science World. It includes the seawall and what we call four, what is it, two, four, six, the corridor that turns into those different street numbers and as well as the local road, Lamy's, Lamy's Mill Road into First Avenue. And so uh, what, what we, the reason that we wanted to choose this was that this is a prime area of, uh, for us to make mobility enhancements. To further meet our safety goals, address our pedestrian and cycling improvement needs, and improve transit access. So just some key facts are almost 3,000 collisions are recorded through ICBC within the year. The corridor within and near the corridor between 2007 and 2016, and that's almost one collision a day. Almost up to 4,000 people walk and 7,000 people cycle along the South Falls Creek seawall per day, and two rapid transit stations, as I pointed out, service 35,000 passengers per day, and, oh sorry, for transit people, I should say total boardings and alightings, and up to 40,000 vehicles f travel along that corridor a day. So it's a, it is a significant opportunity to really see what we can do with this corridor and to address some of our key challenges. And again, it needs to be replicable, so if that's a word. So we need to uh, see, we'll be able to apply this to other parts of the city. So just, this is just a very high level, um, like a, a concept that we have on the website. Um, I again encourage you to have a look and, uh, and kind of see what we're thinking and it kind of unpackages these different, these different corridors and what we can do with them. So I'll pass it over to Doug again to talk about your corridors. Thanks, Ryan. So unlike Vancouver, we didn't exactly have a dedicated corridor with um, some of those particular issues. So instead, we decided, hey, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna first start with making our own dedicated corridor. So we're looking at University Drive as our first step in this process. And we would dedicate um, existing road space and allocate it actually to testing a um, dedicated corridor for AV shuttles, as well as making um, user enhanced user experiences because of the BC Parkway alignment, I know some people may not know, but it actually runs all the way into Surrey as well. Um, between Gateway Station and SFU's new energy systems building. Um, the outcomes out of this pilot would be getting people used to it. People don't know a lot about AV shuttles yet, and so we get a good feedback, learn some lessons to help implement our ultimate goal, which is our Innovation Boulevard corridors. The Innovation Boulevard corridors would take that demonstration project on University Drive and actually operate AV shuttles mixed with traffic. It would connect King George Station in the orange there with Surrey Mar Memorial Hospital to the south, Jim, P Jim Patterson Outpatient Facility to the east, and Green Timbers E Division. Between those facilities and the Emerging Innovation Boulevard area and the Emerging Medical District, there's over 10,000 employees in that area. Um, so this is a great opportunity to make improvements to existing corridors on Fraser Highway in 96 and 140th Street. But even more important is that we actually get to do the opportunity to build a brand new corridor from scratch. 137th Street connects Surrey Mora Hospital and King George Station, and it's be a brand new road where we can implement all the smart um, mobility infrastructure right off the bat, enhanced user experience right off the bat, and actually put in a corridor that has zero collisions 
from day one and onwards. So what else are we doing? So now that we've got a plan, we've got some quarter identified, engagement. Engagement is an important component of the Smart Cities Challenge, and we're asking everyone to help participate and um, learn more about it. So the first thing that we're doing is uh, giving an opportunity for everyone to um, uh, have an opportunity to get into the um, ELA's uh, EZ10 shuttle. Um, between February 1st and February uh, 17th, it's going to be operating at Surrey Civic Plaza, and um, between February 23rd and March 3rd, it's going to be operating um, from at Vancouver's Olympic Village. Um, it's, it's a little 12-person shuttle. It's already operating in over 20 countries worldwide. Um, it's a cool little thing. You've got to register online to, to take a ride. Um, so we strongly encourage you to, to, to participate. Um, also another uh, engagement strategy that we're doing is um, doing Mission Possible. This is an exciting um, uh, escape room challenge where teams are having to strategize, solve riddles, and collaborate to find their way through the, the escape room challenge. Uh, unfortunately, if you haven't already registered, you're out of luck because it is sold out, but there is a wait list. So this is uh, amazing to see that there's so much excitement already for, um, for something like this uh, Smart Cities Challenge. So as Joanna mentioned, where we're at right now, we are kind of currently finalizing proposals and, and making sure that they're going to be in place. Um, but we still want and continued engagement from residents and vendors. So like um, she said, visit our website, smartertogether.ca. And in the end, it's our belief that we are smarter together. And the next stages start here with all of us working together to innovate and design for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna and Doug. I really want to ride on the shuttle, so I'm going to be registering online for sure. Um, okay, so next up we have Kevin Desmond. <laughs> Kevin is the CEO of TransLink. Uh, he's a veteran in the transportation world. He built his experience by providing strong leadership in transportation agencies across North America, uh, beginning in New York City and eventually moving to the West Coast in 1996. Prior to TransLink, he served as general manager of King County Metro in the Seattle metropolitan region for more than a decade. As CEO of TransLink, he oversees planning, financing, and management of a region-wide multimodal transit network. Under Kevin's leadership, ridership in Metro Vancouver has grown faster than any other major metropolitan region in Canada and the United States. Um, okay, before Kevin gets up here, we're going to be playing a short video called TransLink Tomorrow. It better be futuristic, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> When you take a step back and look at the world you live in, you'll notice one thing we all share in common. We like to move. We go to work and come home again. Walk across the street and cycle our way through traffic. We all have this need to move, but when more of us are moving at the same time in the same place, there are consequences. The future is a responsibility we all share together. So together, we must find ways to adapt and create solutions that fit how we're living and evolving, not the other way around. Big changes are on the horizon, and more than ever before, we're making livability a priority in our cities. TransLink Tomorrow represents our shared commitment to search for and create better mobility options so we can all live better lives. We work with partners, engage industry and individuals and champion positive change from everywhere and anywhere we find it. We can all be proud of what we've accomplished, but it's just a start. The question is, and always will be, what's next? That applause for me of the video. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, well, good evening, anyone, everyone. Thanks, Jen, uh, for the introduction in, in our short little video. We, we've, we've shown that video in a, a few different places, including uh, my uh, all-manager uh, town hall just, um, just yesterday. Uh, and this is truly, uh, I mean, it's a great gathering to, to see all the people standing room. There's, there's one person standing in the back, so it must be standing room. Can you see me from back there, man? Holy cow. Uh, but um, great, great participation, and, and obviously there's a lot of interest in, in this 
uh, in this particular topic with those of you in the room and, and clearly here uh, with those of us at TransLink. And we're absolutely delighted um, uh, to be here to, to launch our Future of Mobility speaker series uh, today to this, this packed room. And, and certainly a big shout out to uh, the SFU uh, City program to helping to um, host this. Andy, thank you for helping to host, uh, host us um, tonight. Uh, as well as the city of Vancouver and the city of Surrey. Uh, and uh, Joanne and, and Doug, good luck. Uh, we're hoping that we, we, we get the win um, here nationally with a $50 million um, grant. It's, it's super important and to see the great collaboration um, of the two cities and, and drawing, I'm sure, a lot of the different interests uh, locally and internationally on the, on the vendor side to help make that vision that you guys uh, have laid, off, uh, laid out um, a reality. One of the things that, that truly excites me about um, what, what the cities have going is the Vision Zero and, and the, the safety. It's something I think about all the time uh, running a public transportation uh, organization as well. And the other thing I, you know, I want to think about as well is you see that nice 12-person vehicle is, well, who's driving that vehicle? Nobody's driving that vehicle. Who's driving the vehicles today? 3,500 people who have good professional jobs with good wages, living wages, um, and good benefits. So how do we sort of manage to move into this automated future and think about all the people and all the jobs that are going to have to change in that future? And our speaker tonight, Tim, is going to talk actually a little bit um, about that. But I, I hope all of you are thinking about that as well. I have to think about that, running a transit agency of 7,000 people. TransLink is always looking for innovative solutions for a better transportation future. And so the topics discussed here tonight, such as open and shared data, connectivity, autonomous uh, driving, are very, very timely. An overarching theme today is to strengthen collaboration across Metro Vancouver, hence the two cities. Um, this collaboration will be necessary if we want to maximize the benefits from these trends. Discussions like tonight's will be necessary in breaking down barriers and giving rise to new transport transportation ecosystems, what many have been calling the new mobility, perhaps becoming a, a kind of a trite phrase, but it is a new mobility, isn't it? At TransLink, we see our role as convening the regional discussion around our new mobility future. As we think about the future, we know that transportation is likely to see big changes and we're facing very big questions. Where in the region should we build? Should we actually keep planning capital intensive infrastructure investments like this uh, Broadway um, to UBC uh, SkyTrain that was uh, discussed today? Or can new mobility fill the gap? What is the role of the public sector in the new mobility future? Will we govern private providers or will we continue to operate these new mobility services? Or might we do both? This spring we'll, be, uh, we'll begin our public engagement to update our region's 30-year transportation plan. This, con this convening tonight is in fact part of that and part of that deep dive and really understanding this new mobility future will shape our next 30 years of mobility in this region. We'll be asking you for your thoughts of what makes Metro Vancouver a livable region and what you most value and how we can prepare the transportation system to support your quality of life. We look forward to convening more of these types of events and engaging with all of you. So now I'd like to introduce our special guest um, here tonight, Tim Papandreou. Tim, welcome to Vancouver, but we welcomed you earlier today. Tim actually spoke uh, um, to a, a workshop of all the region's mayors uh, today after the mayor's council. So I want you to know your elected officials as well are digging into these, these concepts. Tim comes to us from San Francisco and is, and is a global expert and thought leader in the future of mobility and automation. He's the founder of Emerging Transport Advisors, a company that helps harness the active, shared, electric, and automated transport of people and things revolution. He, he recently worked at Google X and Waymo, creating strategic partnerships to help commercialize Waymo, Waymo and launch the world's first fully self-driving ride-hailing service. At the city of San Francisco's transportation agencies, as, as their chief innovation officer, he co-founded co the Startup in Residence program connecting startups with government agencies, utilizing technology to address civic challenges. I had to breathe a few times with, with that. Now, I know, Tim and I know each other from, from way back. And, and um, I was the chair of uh, the American Public Transportation Association Sustainability Committee at the time, and, and Tim was a representative from uh, SFMTA. And we were thinking about such quaint things as environmental sustainability back in the day. Who knew where we've come in so many short years? And 
it, it is, so, you know, as so I was thinking about it when I saw Tim today, because I haven't seen him in a long time, it's like, it was just like yesterday. We were thinking about environmental sustainability and, you know, within the APTA world and the transit world, and so much has changed in that such a short period of time. TNCs didn't exist, man. I mean, you know, Uber was probably just getting started, but it hadn't come certainly to Seattle where I was from or around. The pace of change is amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Papandreou. What an introduction. Thank you for that. I uh, really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Uh, it's so much fun to come to the Northwest because you guys have it so good. Everybody complains about how bad it is in each other city, but you need to travel and see other places and come back and kiss the ground here. It's, it's a great place. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a, a bit of a taste of, of some of the work that I've done um, on the future of transportation mobility. And some things will be familiar, some things will be new. Um, I have about 40 minutes, and I'm going to keep it to 40 minutes uh, so we can actually get to some Q&A as well. That's, I think, where we have some uh, great discussion. So what's interesting about cities is that they've taken over the world, basically. We have more people living in cities now than we ever had, and now there is this huge migrational shift to even more people living in cities. And it's not just happening in one part of the world, it's happening everywhere where, where there's human settlement. And at that rate that we're going, we physically don't have the uh, space for everybody to move around the city with the way they do today and multiply that by around the world. It just physically isn't the room. So we have to create new tools and new ways of doing things. Um, and so that's going to be an interesting challenge for us. So technology is amazing when it works. Um, and technology does some really cool things. But the best technology is the technology in the background, not in the foreground. And one of the things for transportation, transportation relies a lot on technology, ver very low tech and very high tech at the same time. These four symbols, my presentation is a lot of icons, so just to, there's going to be not many words. Um, these symbols really help make a lot of our transportation system work. So whether it's the uh, digital cell phone system, GPS, smartphones themselves, which, uh, and then the um, application program interfaces called APIs, which created the ecosystem for apps. None of the things that you do in your day-to-day -day life um, would be possible that relate to technology had not been for these, these four pieces. Put your hand up for people who get anxiety when they see these three symbols, okay? <laughs> Most people in their like, early, early teens, late, early 20s are like, oh my god, I hate these symbols. So when we rely too much on technology, bad things happen. We get really stressed out and, we, and our tolerance gets really crazy. So we really need to be mindful of the technology. Wi-Fi is the best technology because it's in the background. Everybody loves Wi-Fi when it works. Um, but there's other, there's other things in our technology that's in our face and that's not, that's not really helpful. Not all technology is new. Some of the oldest technology is the best technology because it's the best form of human-machine interaction with the least amount of calories and the most satisfaction, and one of the few transportation devices that gives you joy. How many transport options give you joy? And I think most of our world in transportation is so systematic and metric driven, we don't measure happiness and the ability to be uh, in a more elevated mood. So speaking of technology, in our world, our society, we've seen a lot of technology companies kind of claim space in different parts of our society. So whether it's information, whether it's our social, our social world, whether it's in our online retail, or whether it's employment, these companies have basically claimed that space. And uh, in entertainment, there's still the jury's out whether it'll be Netflix or YouTube. But many years ago, there was less than one in 100 people that would watch a YouTube clip a couple of times a week. Now it's about one in five people watch a clip every day. It's the world's largest broadcaster. So that's how quickly things have changed. Now the technology companies are looking and saying, what about mobility? What is the technology opportunity for mobility? The key difference between all the other companies and this is that this is entering the physical space. So once you enter the physical world, what's called IRL in real life, this is a very different, different space. And so technology has done some good things and some bad things that we're proud of and not so happy. So we look at this. Technology is a platform of services, and this is the original platform, the transit platform, right? So, but look at the use on the platform. Not social, not talking to each other. They should be, they could be, they would be, but they don't. This is not new. What's old is new. What's new is old. This is 100 years before. Same thing. 
right? <laughs> hiding in my smartphone, hiding between, bef behind my, my uh, paper iPad. So um, these are much bigger. They take up more space. There's more, more, more elbow room, but same, same concept. And also what's new and controversial is also not new. This is the, the latest scooter craze. Um, you know, these women probably don't use other forms of transport uh, options, but crazy because it gives them joy. This gives them joy. So yes, all the issues about it, but it gives them joy. But this is not new. We're going to rewind 80 years ago. There they were, right? Post office workers had these uh, mopeds. Um, and it, transportation is not just a tool of, of A to B. It's a movement sometimes. The physical tool is, a technology is used as a movement. Here are women who were part of the suffragette jets. They were the first part of the suffragette movement. And women back then weren't allowed to wear pants. This was radical. This was radicalism. So transportation can be used to do very radical things that we're not comfortable with. So technology is a, a tool. It's not, it's not the, um, the answer to everything. It's just the tool to get to the answer. Let's go to transportation, which we're familiar with. So cars. Cars do a lot of amazing things. People love them for many reasons. They give you flexibility, mobility, all this cool stuff. This is the typical advertisement that was sold with cars. <clears throat> Beautiful road. This is the West Coast. Uh, it's in California. Could be any other West Coast cities. Beautiful red car. Red makes you tough and fast. Red's a fast color. Um, it makes you sexy. You're going to get the girl. You're going to get the guy. In California, you're probably going to get both. It's fine. Um, you know, and people say, well, wow, this, this is what I want. And, and I'm going to get this because it's going to give me all these, these things. And then when you buy it, you get this. And you say, wait a second, I, I bought this, right? Like, you did, but so did everybody else, so you get this. Good on you. <laughs> um, and then what we do is we retrofit for the technology because we've made a decision that we're going to do everything we can to make this technology work. And then what happens is we take up more and more space, and all of a sudden we start losing more of our city to more of this space. And here is a photo of Detroit before cars came in the scene, and then the one on the right is when cars came in the scene. They demolished basically almost half of their city to make space for this new technology. So countries have actually made very clear decisions on a technology and they bet all their assets on it and it doesn't work out. It's not the car's fault, it's how we use the car that's the problem. That's the ultimate thing that, that's, that's gone with it. Here in Houston in downtown, half the city is, is surface parking lots. This looks crazy to you but if you're old enough even downtown Vancouver looked like this many years ago. So there's some nodding heads remembering this, right? So it's a, it's a process of, of decision making. Cars have some nasty things that come with it because of the way we use them. Three quarters of our urban air quality issues are because of transportation. 1.2 million people are killed every year because someone's not paying attention um, in the vehicle. And we spend about 10 days of our lives stuck in traffic. People get 10 days of vacation, so you actually spend 10 days of your life stuck in traffic. That's a lot of wasted time. And about 15% of the adult working population around the world can't maintain a full-time job because of lack of access to a regular transportation mode. So we've put a lot of our eggs in this basket, and some of them are rotten, some of them are cracked, and it's time for us to, to reassess this whole thing. Welcome to technology now with transportation. No one's paying attention. No one pays attention anymore. Everybody's doing this and no one's paying attention. If I do this on the sidewalk with somebody else, we hit our heads, it's like, oh, well, that was bad. When you're in a three-ton vehicle, that's a killing machine. We've got to really figure out this is no longer cool. So there's things that need to change in our transport system. Look at our current system that we have. We have cars that are used 5% of the day. So this asset is used only 5% of the day, and it's 80% empty. Yes, there are five seats, we only use one of them though. So this is a huge waste of a really important resource. Public transit doesn't do that much better. In most parts of the, the, the world, especially in North America, the transit system is overwhelmed for a couple of hours in the morning and in the evening, and the rest of the day it's not really carrying its, its full capacity because it's not designed properly. And they're using a 12 or 18 meter vehicle, which is not sufficient for what it's needed, or it's too much. And we know that 80% of the rides are on the top 10 lines, and the other 75 lines are carrying squirrels. You know, this is not the use, of, this is not efficient use of our resources. So we have to now think about this from a perspective of moving forward, that this is not going to work any, any longer. We have to change. And so what's happening now is we're seeing a sunsetting of the traditional car ownership model and the traditional fixed route public transit model to the dawning of an integrated multimodal shared mobility system 
that is now starting to figure out different parts of the puzzle and how it actually relates with, with, the, with the system itself. And to do this, you look at the, this is the US profile of the percentage of trips and the trip distance. Sorry, it's in miles, I'll translate in, in kilometers. So two thirds of all trips in the US are less than 10 kilometers and the majority of them are done by car, right? These shared mobility companies are coming in saying, I can peel away the one and two and three and four and five kilometer trips and put them in these shared mobility devices, whether it's a scooter or e-bike, a moped or a shared ride service. And public transport in the urban form is unbeatable because it's the, it's the number one way to move the, least, the most amount of people in the least amount of space. But you've got to give it the space, otherwise it's stuck behind traffic, right? So this is a really important thing that we're focusing on a technology that is not moving the majority of people in the most effective and efficient way. And it's hard for people to say, it's easy for us great folks in the room to say, well, you need to give up your car because of this, that, whatever. We have a climate crisis, we have this crisis, we have that crisis, you're in my way crisis, we have all these different other crises, right? But the person says to you, but wait a second, I want to use ride hailing or these services, but where are the baby seats for my little kid? I can't put them in these services. Where do I put all my groceries and my stuff? My kids got soccer practice, band practice, church practice, why practice, 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 because we overschedule our children because of technology. And I also need my SUV for those four times a year. I'm going to go to Whistler, but I really don't go. So, <laughs> you know, that's the problem we have. And so we have a real, real issue. So it's not going to be roses and easy just because we edict it. We're going to have to figure out some limitations. And so these are the major trends that are converging at the same time. Sharing is becoming real. It's a becoming a real big thing. Public transit is the, what's called the OG, the original gangster of sharing. It's the first one. Yay, transit. Now there's all these other parts of transit that are going to be formed. And we have to redefine the term public transport. And I'll talk about that in a second. Electrification is becoming normalized now. We've spent a lot of time holding it back, but now the, the unit economics are working out. And now we're moving towards automation. We're going to make things work uh, more effectively and efficiently. Each of these on their own will not solve our next generation problems, but the three of them combined, which is why they're called the three revolutions, they will actually make a huge opportunity dent for us to, to solve some of these massive issues. So let's look at the transportation platform. So the word platform is basically that base layer where things interact. You have the mobility layer, which is all of those different services that are interacting. People call this transport as a service or mobility as a service. The idea that you can route, book, and pay all in one system with one account, common sense, right? Hugely uh, interesting and radical to do. Then you have the digital layer, which is linking all that data. What's everybody doing, where they're going, all the different interactions and stuff. And then you have the infrastructure layer, how we actually lay the system on the street. The technology companies are looking at it and saying, we actually can do this. We can actually integrate this whole thing. And so how that plays out is going to be very interesting because while we're focusing on making our transportation system work better, the technology company is looking at saying, how do we make our life work better? How do we link this to our calendar, to our assistant, to the weather outside, to payments, to lifestyle? All these have been things where they're calling it like a lifestyle as a service. So these are the big transformations. And this has nothing to do with whether the bike is better or the train is better. It's what's available and what can I optimize. And it's not just happening for passenger transport. It's happening for freight as well. Freight's moving this direction much faster because the digitization of freight has orders of magnitude of benefit for the whole system. So you can get your toothpicks from Taiwan in one hour, right? That's the key for this. That's the goal. I'm kidding. But this is not the best use of our resource, but it's actually just a trend in how this is actually moving. The thing is, it's not going to happen everywhere at the same time, and it's going to happen unevenly, just because of physical, topographical, and geolocation of where you are on, in the world. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a transition. That's why it's called the sun setting and a sunrise. And over the next decade, you're going to see a lot of these signals. You're going to remember this presentation and say, oh, I saw what he was talking about, because these things will start popping up in, in different forms. What works in the central core of this area is very different from what work in the suburbs, the outer suburbs, the rural areas, and then the hinterland and, and the, the mountains. So they're going to have different types of services and opportunities for these different locations. It's not a one-size-fits-all because it can't work everywhere uh, for everybody. So let's dabble a little bit in automation, an area I worked on for a couple of years. Automation requires four key pieces, artificial intelligence, machine learning, which is understanding and classifying objects, a sensor suite of understanding and perceiving the environment, and some mapping to know what, what's around you. How this works is basically uh, 
complementary vision system, radar, and LIDAR. LIDAR is that light, light radar. And then a, a bunch of sensors. And what the vehicle does, it basically says, it asks itself these four main questions, which you do every day in your, in your vehicle or in, in your bicycle or on, on your train. Where am I? What's around me? What's everybody doing? What should I do next? Sounds really simple. Reams of data behind that, but this is the, the fundamentals. And what should I do next creates that green path of safe travel. How it detects and classifies objects around it is all the input that has been given into the, into the system. It can't physically see. It has no values, has no morals, it has no conscience, and it has no uh, sides to bear. It's, it does what it's told to do. So it's only as good or only as conscious or careful as we program it, which is why from a governance perspective, we need to be very clear about what we want this technology to actually do because it'll do what it, it's told to do and it'll optimize for what it's told to do. Here's an example of where one of the self-driving vehicles that I worked at um, sees the world. It can see 360 degrees for up to three football fields in every direction and it can analyze every single one of those movements. These are bicycles. So there's 100 bicycles, a bunch of the folks were like circling around to see how does it actually understand? It figured out very quickly that they're people, they're on bicycles, bicycles move at this speed, and they're going in these directions. And its response was, I'm just going to sit still because there's a hive of bicycles around me and I'm just going to chill. I'm not going to move forward because they're vulnerable road users. I'm not supposed to go anywhere near them. So that's it's it. That's what it does. And automation will come in three flavors. It's going to come in moving people, moving things to get your toothpick for one, from one hour, or your mascara or whatever you need from Amazon in, in one hour, or doing things, street sweeping, garbage collection, mining, agriculture, construction, all those things. Basically, if there is wheels and an engine tied to this vehicle, it will be automated. And automation is a technology, it's not a vehicle. So the press gets really good at confusing people, it's a common thing happening all over the world right now. Um, in this world, they're saying they're always using autonomous cars, autonomous cars versus this. You know, autonomous car, it's actually aut automated vehicles compared to non-automated vehicles. That's really how you should think about it. And this is what it looks like. If you have to get into a vehicle that needs brakes, pedals, and steering wheel control, it's not an automated vehicle. It's a vehicle. If you can walk into that vehicle and do what you want to do best is to, you know, look at the Kardashian Instagram account, whatever you've got to do, whatever, whatever rocks your boat. Um, that's an automated vehicle. There is no control of the operations of the system. You have a control of the ride. So you can turn the ride off or on, but you don't have control of the brakes, steering wheels, pedals. That's the difference between a company that's automated and a company that's actually not automated. Okay? And the difference is that it changes inside very, very quickly. So we call the vehicle is focused on the driver. Today's cars are focused on driving, and the dashboard is absolutely fundamental. Why do you talk about dashboards in your work? Because it's the most pertinent information that you need at this point in time. So the dashboard is the most important focus. The entire vehicle is focused on the driver and the dashboard. When you go to an automated vehicle, it completely changes. The focus now is on the rider. You now are a rider of the service, you're no longer the driver. The computer is actually the driver. What that means is it frees up that 10 days of time that you have spent behind the steering wheel, and you shouldn't be doing this anyway right now, but many people do. And now you can do things like watch TV, watch movies, learn a new language, have a conference call, go shopping, play games, go to sleep, whatever it is you can do. You're probably going to do things that we don't want to talk about, but it'll be possible. So that's possible because the form factor of the vehicle is agnostic to the automation technology. It's not about an automated car. It's about an automated vehicle propulsion system attached to a vehicle type, whether it's a truck, a bus, a garbage vehicle, a small passenger vehicle, a large passenger vehicle, it's irrelevant. It's the automation is what actually is in, is the relevant piece of this. And so whether you're having a traditional seat that you know today, whether this seat reclines back and takes you to the next city overnight, whether you're standing up really tight because it's the best way to move the most amount of people, that's the form factor opportunities that we have. And what that does is it means that most of our transportation uh, operations today are focused on the driver's capabilities. How long can the driver drive for? How far can they go? What makes sense economically? All of our economics are tied to the cost of our driver. When you go automated, you no longer have those, those uh, parameters anymore to, to be held back by. So there's a whole different opportunity. 
For a transit agency, the choice is, do we expand service by up to 50% from the savings, or do we contract service budget by 50% because of the savings? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a either or or both. But the reality is, especially in urban public transit, the idea that you're going to lose the driver is actually not really true. There, you may lose the role of the driver, but a good proportion of our riders still need some sort of physical assistance to get on and off the vehicle, which means that even if it's 5% of the people, there has to be somebody there. And their role will shift to be more of the ambassador or the operator, which is what they want to be. They claim that they're operators. They happen to drive the bus, but they like the idea of being able to do it. They do many more things than just drive. So freeing them up from the hardest part of the task to things they care about is actually a potential opportunity there as well. But it doesn't come with its limitations and its issues. The, the, the good thing is it's a transition. This is going to take a while to start uh, coming forward, so there's time to prepare and, and get that transition in order. The other question that we have as well is how will we, will we behave in these vehicles? It's a whole different kettle of fish, frankly, to be inside these vehicles than it is in current your own vehicle. We are the worst behaved people in our own vehicles. Um, there's a little giggles here, but we do really bad things. We, like, we eat, we drop things, we've got trash, you know, we, it's like, oh, not me, my car's spotless. Okay, well, Google has a lot of data, trust me, there's a lot of people that are doing really bad things in their cars. And that behavior is actually not uh, good for, for the mankind in general. And when we were doing the technology of these services, we had a really good understanding of that having a technology that requires you to pay a little bit of attention now and then, and then having to take control over it, which is what's called level three, we found that that was just not sufficient and safe enough. We wanted to really focus on level four, which was you sit back and let the computer do the driving for you because of that fact that people do really silly things when they're left to their own devices. And in the vehicle itself, it's going to be interesting because we're used to getting in a taxi where we don't really know the taxi driver or the, the Uber driver. We have a sense through the app and we kind of get there. We have to do small talk. How many times have you actually gotten a conversation? It's like, I don't really want to talk to this person. I'm tired. I just want to look. I've got to do work or emails. You know, politely smile. And go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you won't have any of that. So on your own, you're going to have this chamber that you can do your own thing and, and possibly... Um, do what, what, what makes you happy. In the transit environment, nothing much is really going to change because we have automated transit now in, in Vancouver. You, up, you kind of behave with this space the same way you would uh, in that vehicle. What's interesting is the, is the opportunity on the right. When we share these small spaces with no driver to give us small talk, no icebreaker, and really quiet space, how are you going to interact with this other stranger? Are you going to talk to them? Are you going to pretend that you're looking at your phone? Are you going to do what they did with the newspaper? Like, what are you going to do? Like, we don't know. So we're going to see how this all plays out. Um, it's also very, very quiet. So sounds, noises, our body makes noises, all these things, right? So how are we going to do in this space? So it's just these are, in the transit system, you kind of just walk away. But what are you, what are you going to, where do you walk away? There's nowhere to walk away. So um, this is going to be very interesting as we move forward. And then what's the role of automation? It's, it's about what is the purpose of this automation? So there's, uh, in Phoenix, we worked on some partnerships with Valley Metro. We did a first, last mile access for them. The Waymo vehicle basically brings people to um, uh, express transit or to the light rail system. That's an obvious use case and opportunity. There's also opportunities where it can be the transit as well. It can actually move people along uh, in the corridors as well and connect to other services. It's really up to what the, the, the urban area or the area that's being served, what makes sense for, for the vehicle. Again, it's not about automated cars versus, automated tra versus transit. It's automated vehicles and what are they used for versus non-automated vehicles, right? This will be automated eventually. I don't know exactly when, but all vehicles will be automated eventually. And to do that means that we have to really work together, and I really love the, the Vancouver Surrey Partnership. We did this in San Francisco on the Smart City Challenge. Collaboration with this is key because no one has, the, no one has all the answers. Government on the left needs to work with the corporations on the right, and academia, we're actually in SFU. They have a lot of skills in this area of data analysis, data metrics, and research that either side don't really have, so this partnership but it has to be focused on people, people at the very center of this. We're not doing this for shiny new toys. That's easy. What is it for? It's to solve and, and help people. Transportation is not about the infrastructure or the service. It's about connecting people to the moments in their lives. 
That's how we do transportation. Okay, and that's the fundamental thing. So as a city or a region or a, or a government, you now need to think more like the tech companies and be more like a platform. And that platform is basically the adjudicator of the space. If we're talking about new streets being re redesigned and digitization of our streets, we're creating a new internet of streets. And that means that as a public agency, you're the guardian of this galaxy. You know, who likes that movie? I love that show, sorry, it's really Star trek -y. I love all that sort of stuff. So, being the guardian of this space means that you've got to set some very clear rules. Like, what are the rules on this platform? What do we want to see happen? What are the outcomes that we want? And think about what are the, the different layers of responsibility? There's a digital layer of all that data integration management. Who owns what? How do you manage it? How do you control it? How do you look after it? It's so heartening sometimes to hear people say, I want the data, I want the data. But as a person who's worked in data for a while, if you can't digest the data, if you can't analyze the data, if you can't store it, manage it, and protect it, why do you want it? You don't need it. What you need is answers from the data, and that's a really different question. On the, the third, second layer is the mobility layer. How do we interact and connect all these different mobility providers, and what are the rules? How should they operate? All these different questions. What are the outcomes we want from those, those operators? And the third layer is the layer that we know really well, which is the infrastructure. How do the streets work? And that's where you have the most control, because even though you may not be able to dictate when the technology comes to your, to your city, if you have a street design laid out in a way that promotes walking, bicycling, or micromobility, high capacity, could be called public transit or carpooling, and general use with a pleasant environment connected to really good land use, you're done. Whatever comes in will just work with that network. Getting to that point is really tough, and unfortunately some mayors are saying that the technology is going to solve this for them, but it's not. You have to do the homework yourself, which means you have to figure out what you stand for, what you care about, and what you'll protect so you can guide this. You can't dig your head in the sand. It's going to come. And when it comes, you have to be ready for it. And when you're ready for it, you can guide it and help it grow and actually get your outcomes that you want. So in the platform, you have to have some filters in the platform. And safety has to be number one. This thing has to be safe, number one. Not just safe for the system, but for the users and for everybody else around it. Equity is a really important piece. These are not equal. There are going to be winners and losers. How do you maintain and ensure equity? Some people still don't have smartphones, and those that do can't afford the data plans. How do they gain access to this? Some people are not banked. Uh, they don't have credit cards. How do they maintain um, access to these things? How do we ensure that no one gets blacklisted for being a bad actor, someone who's basically thrown up in the vehicle four times and you're deleted from the account? What happens now? How do I get around? So it's, uh, we have to be very careful that we have these guardrails set in place. Interoperability, making sure the systems actually work together, and then making sure that it's actually affordable for everybody. This shouldn't be an elite service, whether it's a scooter service or a transit service or a bike share service. It needs to be available and affordable for everybody. Otherwise, it's not going to work. What's the point of doing this? Remember, the agencies that own the streets own the platform for everybody, not for the elected officials, not for the activists, not for the particular voiced interests, not for the NIMBYs or the YIMBYs or the bananas, which is build nothing anywhere and never again, right? Welcome to San Francisco. Um, so <laughs> it's not for that. It's for everyone, which means that you have to get out of your comfort zone and reach out to other people in your community that you've never spoken to with. You have to figure out new tools to engage with them, to ask them, what do you need? Rather than, look at this shiny toy, isn't it awesome? What do you need? It may not be the shiny new toy. They may need access to work or to jobs, or it's got nothing to do with the transportation services, but it has everything to do with, with their, their quality of life. Again, transportation is about connecting people to the moments in their lives, not about the infrastructure. And of course, sustainability, but more than just sustainability, it's not just about emissions, noise, and waste, and so on. It's does this thing actually work financially? We know that we subsidize public transport for reasons. And we also know that certain ride-hailing services are subsidized through venture capital. Both systems are being subsidized. It's how much of the subsidy are we willing to, to bear to make sure this system works for everybody. Bike share can't make money on its own. Scooters here can't make money on its own. We have to work together to figure out what is the right price to move a person from A to B, and what is the right cost that we're willing to bear to move that person from A to B, and the thing from A to B as well, because we're going to be moving people and things. 
So as an agency, not that this was any easier, now you're going to have, have two systems to work with. There's the public transportation system, which may have interactions and interconnection with other different shared mobility, but there's, also, there's going to be a private transportation system as well, which will also have its own interactions and interoperability. The key that you're going to have to play as the agency is, is basically referee. You have to coach both of them. Some things they'll do better than you do, some things you'll do better than they do, but together we have to figure out how to actually make this work better for the customer, because the customer is the person that is our number one focus. And if they're not happy, they literally switch to the other mode. And if you're focused on ensuring sustainable mobility, et cetera, et cetera, you have to make sure that you're meeting the needs of all the customers. How do we do this? Well, it's a lot of work. I'm not going to kid you. Uh, I've been working for a couple of years. And I found that there's really some new areas of focus that agencies are going to need. One is understanding data science. We need more people understanding data science and how to digest data, ingest data, visualize it, and then react to it. It's really interesting to see some cities who actually get all the data they want, and the politics does what it wants anyway. What's the point of having a data scientist? You need to empower these people to do something. And I purposely have chosen some gender identifiers. It's, it's, a, it's a little thing that I have. We need more women in data science. We need more women in science. We need more women in transportation. And we need to end the male domination of this, this, this economy, of this service. We need to bring more of different people in the system because the world is not 99% white males. It's actually less than a third, or if, that, if that at all. And we need to bring in more people that look like the system of users that are using it. On the second area that we need is we need more understanding of urban psychology. How do people think? How do they use things? Why do they use things? All these tech companies actually have that. They know exactly what will make you want to use the app more. It's called stickiness. How do you make this thing become more sticky? And many agencies have not spent enough time to understand who are their actual customers. Why are they using the public transport system? Where? How? And if they're not using public transport, why? What will it take to get them to use public transport? Are you willing to go there? If the answer is no, they're not your customers. Forget about them. If they keep coming at your meetings and barking, saying, we're not going to build that extra line. We're focusing on this instead. But be clear about what it is that you actually stand for. And then the storytelling. This is a huge, huge shift that's going to happen in the next decade. And without proper storytelling, it's going to get a lot of pushback and a lot of backlash. We've had this thing called bike lash, you know, where cities did not engage the public very well and they built too many bike lanes too quickly, which frankly were desperately needed a decade ago. But because of that lack of community engagement, there's now bike lash. Bike lanes are basically considered the Trojan horse of gentrification. So we have to be very mindful of who are we doing this for and, and how do we bring everybody in? And it's not just the tech jobs. If this system scales as it's basically shown that it will, we're going to need a lot more maintenance and mechanics and services that are not basically uh, adequately supplied, more cleaning services, more battery swap out services, all these different services that really don't exist today, and then more customer service. There's going to be a lot more interactions with these services that we currently have positions uh, available now. So it's not clear about what this is going to play out, but we should be able to set those guardrails in place about what we want. And so as an agency, as a city, as a, as a transport provider, a lot of these things you don't know the answer to, and that's fine. What you do know, though, is that you know how to ask the problem. And using design thinking, many agencies now using design thinking to think of an idea that can be solved in three, six, nine, 12 months, try it out, experiment it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, iterate, fix it, move forward. If that doesn't work, get rid of it, move on. Um, but many agencies are not allowed to fail in public because they can never say we made a mistake, right? And if you're able to say, yep, we tried it, it didn't work, move on. End of story. Let's go to the next thing. Tech companies do this every day. It's called rapid prototyping. They do it all day long. Um, and if it works, you can scale it on the right-hand side and make it citywide. There's a program, which I was mentioning in my, bio, in my intro, where we call it Startup in Residence Program, where we basically help cities identify problem sets and then match them with civic-minded startups that can actually solve these problems in 16 weeks. So it's not these 25-year programs. It's what can we have done in 16 weeks. And then... As we look at the street, the, trend, the, the infrastructure layer, what I wanted to just quickly touch upon was how computers actually see things in a way that we just take for granted. When we do classification of space, we basically say, okay, we put a square around everything in a shape. The average person takes up about one square meter as they walk, depending on how much breakfast you had, it's about one square meter. Um, a person on a micro device, whether it's a scooter or a bicycle or something, takes a little bit less than two square meters, but it's about double the space of what a person uh, needs for walking. 
A person in a private passenger vehicle needs eight of these, these squares are called tiles. They need eight of these tiles to fit in their vehicle. Already we're putting in biases in the algorithm on how to do transportation and the machine learning basically kicks back and says, that's a lot of space for this one unit. Is that right? Am, am I supposed to be doing this? Um, and we're like, wow, you have an honorary transportation plan degree already. <laughs> so the answer is no, we shouldn't be doing this, but we are, so what should we do about it? And if automation works out, and if it does the things that it promises to do by making things safer, those front two tiles can go away because that's where the engine is and that's where the crumple zone is. The back two tiles where all of our stuff is, all our junk in the trunk, all of that goes away. And now those four tiles is what we really need to move people around. And so in a street environment, we can move a lot more people using those same tiles if we actually reconfigure them. That's why don't be stuck on the vehicle shape. The form factor will shift and change. But clearly, moving people by walking and cycling is 100 times more efficient than, than people in these three-ton machines. So what do we do as policymakers on the street? We need to set a signal because these systems need a signal. They don't know what to do. If you see this environment like this, this basically says to them that this is all about cars. If the system sees this environment, they're like, oh, okay, there is a high-capacity vehicle and a medium-capacity vehicle, a micro-capacity vehicle, and walking. I get it. This is my space. I won't work on that space. Not the Facebook my space. This is the actual space space. The real IRL in real life, right? And so if you're going to automate this, all that happens is that the vehicles just change form factor. So the high-capacity, you call it public transit. Low-capacity, we call it self-occupancy. Self those are the two form factors that it'll play with. And if you have dedicated lanes for high occupancy, the technology will basically be told that in order to enter this, this, um, this uh, lane, you need X number of, of occupants. It's going to find them and then put them in to use that street because that's going to give it better travel uh, optimization. Its role is to optimize. It's not going to say, boo, it's not fair, I don't have enough lanes to myself. It's going to do what it's told to do and it's going to find it. So, but without those guardrails, it's going to do what it's going to do. And, if you have a street like this, um, it's just going to be more like this. You're going to replace every vehicle that's going to be automated. There'll be more of them because there'll be more services. There'll be like taco trucks and this truck and yoga vehicles and everything else will be in there. And it's going to basically just make the same thing, if not the same, if not worse. So it really comes down to the policymakers, the people who own the, the guardians of the street platform, to set the rules and set the signals so that these systems can actually work. And we know this stuff back to front. We know that a car-oriented street, no matter how wide it is, only moves a couple of thousand people an hour, but a multimodal street can move up to 30,000 people an hour. This is tested, baked, and studied to death. No more argument. This is it. We know this. So if that's the case, that street should look like this. And now the automated vehicle technology knows to, if it's on the left-hand side, it's low occupancy. If it's high occupancy, it can use the red lanes. The green lane doesn't exist. It's actually a wall. I don't go there. So I just focus on my, my domain and my territory. And in San Francisco, we started playing with this with the smart city process where we're saying, look how we look at congestion. This street is congested. Photos don't do it justice, but it's a long line of cars. Congested vehicles are actually an optical illusion. It's not congested. It's just there's, a, there's, empty, there's vehicles with empty seats in it, and it's just taking up a lot of space. But there's 21 cyclists, people, in, people bicycling, who take up less than a third of that space. That's congested. They're trying to get through as well. And then these transit vehicles are waiting in line be, behind some cars as well. Who's more important? They're all citizens. They all pay taxes. They all contribute to society. Clearly, they're all, they're all equal. And so we need to give them the space that they need um, in, in the environment that they take up and make some hard decisions about where or not these other vehicles are actually uh, are guests they can be in here, but they have to behave, or they're not welcome because we have to move more people and we just can't physically make it work. But that's not a call of the technology. That's the call of policymakers. And so you have to be very careful. This can't solve your problems for you. You have to solve your problems and it'll, it'll enable the outcomes that you want. So that's what that looks like in San Francisco. We set a very clear policy of red carpet for transit, green carpet for bicycles and micromobility, and the residual space in the street is for everybody else. We don't say you can't go there, we're just going to say that you're a guest. And as a guest, you're welcome until you're not. So you behave. And that allows for all these new devices to basically learn, grow, and play. And then that helps understand how we operate the system. That's the, that's the, the first part. The second part is how do we actually pay for all this stuff? Because if we do shared, electric, and automated, most of our car-based, fossil fuel-based taxes go away. People aren't parking anymore. 
people aren't paying taxes for gasoline taxes, people aren't paying for these registration fees because they're writing services. So all these things start to basically go away. And we have to figure out a way to basically transfer those loss of revenues into this space. And the best way to do that right now is through digitizing the curb space and digitizing the street. So there's a lot of companies that are working on how to actually digitize this. What this means is that a Pudo is a nickname for a pickup and a drop off. And not a poodle, it's a Pudo. And the Pudo basically determines the time, the type of vehicle, the type of emissions that vehicle has and the space it's taking and an appropriate fee for using the right of way. Not just when it picks up and drops off, but when it's traveling in that real time space. So one of the first ways, if you guys are really hardcore about mobility pricing and making sure that everyone pays their fair share, this is the first out the gate way to do it in a systematic and clear way that makes absolute sense to everybody. They're not gonna love it, but it's much more doable in the interim uh, and much more applicable as a fee transfer for, for your transportation needs. When we get to drones, different story, they're going to need to know where to, they're going to need the same uh, tiles in the sky. Which corridors do I go in? Do I go above streets only? Am I allowed over private residences? A whole new area that you can um, uh, lose sleep over. But that's another, another conversation. So just to close up, the real future for cities and for agencies is to become, to shift from being a transportation provider or regulator to being a mobility manager, and as that mobility manager, to be, to be managing the platform. That's really where you have the greatest opportunity. You can help uh, catalyze land use. You can help catalyze street design changes. You can ameliorate the effects of parking that take up all that space. You can redesign parking structures, and you can also improve it through performance metrics and make it work so that we can shift from our current messy situation that we have today, which is too many cars, too many things everywhere, everyone's stuck in traffic. The pregnant mama is waiting behind the guy who's waiting to pick up his chips. That is not a good use of our resources. And shifting it over to a system where we're moving more people through the most efficient way, and we're reclaiming our cities back for people, whether it's through open space, affordable housing, many of the issues that are, we're stuck with right now, and working towards a much more sustainable and more just and inclusive future. So I really thank you for your time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Is this on? Do we need to use our transit voice? Hello? Okay. Is mine on? Okay, good. Okay, so for some housekeeping, um, you're going to be submitting your questions through Slido. So all the information is up here. Go to slido.com. The hashtag is mobility. One thing I'm going to ask is that you try to make it understandable for me. Some of your <laughs> questions are really, really technical, like have acronyms. I don't understand what that means. So try to... Could you guys try to put it in plain English, um, just so that we can, so that I know, and if I get into real trouble, I'll just ask you to decipher <laughs> yeah, the acronym. Show me the acronym, I'll <laughs> um, Okay, I'm just going to kick it off with, with a question of my own, though, just because when I was watching the presentation from Joanna and Doug, they were really talking about how they wanted a zero collision corridor. Mm -hmm. And what I'm curious about is how AV uh, fits into that vision, and I am thinking about the highly publicized fatality in Arizona where an Uber uh, vehicle hit a pedestrian. So how does safety fit into this vision? Yeah, I think safety is fundamental. Uh, the safety was the, one of the reasons why uh, Google got into this project in the first place. Many people ask me, what's a data company doing in, in uh, traffic safety? Well, 94% of all collisions are because of uh, human error. And that's a data issue. And so focusing on the safety from the get-go trying to reduce those situations where the collision or the severe fatality or the fatality would actually happen would be a huge first step. We make mistakes as people. It's just, that's, the, that's just who we are. We're human beings. And the Vision Zero philosophy of safety is that people make mistakes, but the mistake shouldn't result in death. And it should be an accommodating uh, mistake. And I think and AVs can play a huge role in that because they can actually avoid the majority of these collisions because they can see and detect three football fields in every direction. To your question about why didn't that happen, is because it does what it's programmed to do, and if you turn certain things off, it can't physically see and do things. 
And so the, uh, this is public, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, the Uber vehicle was not working as it, as it should have been. And so uh, Waymo was very concerned about how that was being approached and it was very clear that that technology doesn't, doesn't do that. So again, it's what you program the vehicle for and that's why we need to have very clear guidelines, very clear standards about what we expect these vehicles to do in our public right of way. Okay, so having cleared that question though, so their vision of a, of a, of a zero collision corridor, how does the autonomous vehicle fit into that? Yeah, so if they have a zero collision corridor, um, that means that there are no collisions with anything anywhere ever. Um, <clears throat> so maybe they define collisions uh, in a certain way, but there might be some fender benders, et cetera. AVs would be part of that mix, and uh, in a zero collision corridor, you want to have zero collisions, which means that everybody's going to be looking out for each other. How you do that is actually going to be difficult in a mixed fleet environment. Some vehicles will be automated, some will be connected, some won't be, and so driver behavior both computer and driver behavior have to, be, have to become much more in sync. So educating the public about what, we, what expectations are and how you drive, having the engineering to make it very visible and clear about how you can actually avoid these collisions is gonna be fundamental for that, for that success. And the, the technology layer, which is the AR, AV technology layer, will just respond to the environment that it's in. Okay, here's a question that I really like. Um, how much do you tip an, an AV? How much do you what? How much do you tip? I don't even know if you tip at all. So um, when we had the early rider program in, in, in Phoenix, we asked the early riders, like, you know, how do they feel about this service? Like, what do they like? What do they don't like? And one of the things they said is that we get about half an hour of our life back every day by using this service because a lot of young families with kids. And we said, what's that worth to you? And they said, it's priceless. You know, I, I might, even, might even save my marriage with this. I, I don't know. Um, and we said, well, how much would you actually pay for it? And they're like, pay? You don't pay for things with Google. Everything's free. So... It was a really big, like, oh, we have to figure this out. And so the answer is, I'm not sure. The, the reason I like that question is it does get to this heart of, like, how do we treat robots? Yes. Um, and when I was preparing for this talk, I was reading a lot of press articles. One of the things I was reading about that is that people in Arizona, where Waymo is testing, people tend to throw rocks at the cars. Um, so how do you get beyond, you know, when we get on the bus, there's some a driver. Some people, not everyone. Some people. Yeah, some people. But there's always those people. But yeah. It does speak, you know, do you watch that show, Black Mirror? Yes, I try and avoid it because some of it feels really real. So depressing. <laughs> it's so depressing. I had to stop watching it, actually. Yeah, I had to, too. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Just rom-coms from now on. Only rom-coms. But know. how will we as humans, you know, interact with these uh, vehicles that, you know, do we tip them? Do we be nice to them? Mm -hmm. um, who polices the space inside of them? Mm -hmm. How do we figure out all these questions? Yeah, so these are really important questions that the, the answers are still being uh, thought through, and that's why I think having more of the community and, and collaborative environment from the get-go on what we want them to do. What do we want the rules to be inside these vehicles? What, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, technically, it's a private public space. It's like an airplane, it's like a, it's like a bus. There are social contracts that we engage in when we actually are in these environments. And so we need to figure that out. There has to be a level of safety. Many of the, some of the companies have cameras inside. There's a live help button. You can talk to an actual live operator. There are these mechanisms to make people feel more comfortable inside there, but we still haven't, we still haven't thought these things through. And there's, there's a lot of questions rather than answers at, at this stage. Um, how do we behave around them is how do we behave around vehicles today? You know, we're not the best, uh, we, don't, we don't have the best behaviors inside and outside the vehicle. Unfortunately, in some cities, we're aggressive pedestrians, we're aggressive cyclists, we're aggressive drivers. We need to tone it down a bit because these vehicles are incredibly polite. And once people realize that they're very polite, they may become impolite towards them. And so we may have to have a new rule of how we engage in the public right of way. And those are things that are very brand new. We haven't really had enough of these conversations, but to me it's like how do we behave today and how do we behave tomorrow and take the AV out of the equation, that should not be the reason why. It's how do we behave today and how do we want to behave tomorrow? What's the difference? Here's a question that a couple of people have asked. Um, what is the outlook on timing for fully automated systems? Everyone asked this question. And there was another question about how some industry leaders say that um, this is just not realistic. There's too many variables, especially with rain and snow. So what, like, sort of what's the future looking like? So I'm going to put in my crystal ball. I'm going to tell you the answer. Um, I'm not. Um, <clears throat> if I had that answer, I wouldn't have to work anymore. So uh, it depends on what you mean by, what, what do you mean by automation and, and what does it actually look like? So in those three categories that I mentioned, 
automation of doing things is going to move very quickly because it's actually a very simple, uh, uncomplicated environment, whether it's precision agriculture, the combine harvester goes up and down, mining, construction, etc. Those things are going to move fairly quickly and they're already starting to pop up in different places. The moving of things is going to take a little bit longer because it's a little bit more complex, even though a product doesn't really care how it got there from A to B. But on moving people, that's the most complex, the most complicated, because people care about their wait time, their ride, all the transit indicators that we have. So that's going to take some time. So if I could just pause a little bit, I'd say that in the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot more pilot cities around the world. In the next five years, you're going to see pretty good uh, distribution of, of those pilot cities. And then over the next decade, we're going to see significant amount of metropolitan areas that have De demonstrably and visible presence of AVs doing a lot of things in those areas. So it's about a 10-year transition, but once, just ask the question, when does every metro have these services? It's going, to take a long, it's going to take a long time because you have to solve for snow and for all the different temporal and um, uh, temperature situations across the world. The different infrastructure, you know, I went to school in Mumbai for a little bit. That's a very different environment than Vancouver. Um, the Netherlands is much more set up for this than anywhere else because they've got very clear demarcations of where people on bicycles and people walking and vehicles are. All of those things, the base layer layers, will determine how quickly. And then does the market want to go there? You can't just will them to come. They have to want to actually come here. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me is that transit uh, agencies around North America have a fundamental problem of trying to get funding just to run basic services like New York's subway system comes to mind, the struggles that we've had here in Metro Vancouver over the years just to get funding unlocked. So given that really basic need just to maintain current service, how do you, how do you make the ask for this kind of futuristic future? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, well, the good thing is is that transit has, for, for the many parts of the last couple of decades, always been at the cutting edge of, of new technology, whether it was um, in-vehicle displays, some of the census, census suites, some of the, the data counting metrics, et cetera. Transit has always been the kind of like, even hyperelectric vehicles are really the first that kind of test this out because they've taken on demonstration grants to actually test out the market. So I think it's a really good opportunity to test more of this stuff out. But in terms of fundamentally understanding how to actually pay for the transport system that we have today, we have to look at the whole transport system. We are woefully unfunded in transit and we are over-subsidizing other transportation modes. We have to level set this. But that takes a lot of political courage because the full cost accounting of our transport system hasn't been done yet. And in a full cost accounting world for the urban economists out there, if you know what I'm talking about, you would actually be paid to walk, you'd be paid to bicycle, and you'd pay through the nose to drive your own car by yourself at 6 p.m. rush hour in downtown Vancouver. That's what full cost accounting means. And the transit system would have goo gobs of money because all of that shift would go over to them. So it's not about how do we fund the transit system, it's how do we actually adequately uh, manage our transportation system's finances, which are woefully skewed right now. So that's a fundamental question for the policymakers. And they also need the political will to do things. So. That's why they're policy makers. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, here's one. Uh, remember the Jetsons? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, will drones become a mode of transportation for people? Don't laugh. Isn't Boeing actually doing this? There's several here? companies yeah. that are working on this right now. So there is uh, automated helicopter services that are being um, experimented with right now. This is actually a prime candidate region for that because you have this one of the busiest helicopter services um, in the world. So yes, there's definitely opportunity there. The question is, what does it look like? Do we, does it make sense, and how different, better, and more um, effective is it than the existing helicopter network we have now? So the question is yes, possibly, maybe. Wouldn't they crash into each other? Like, if there was a lot of them? Anyways, that's just what I was thinking. No, it's actually safer to use it up in the air than it is on the ground. There's less things to interact with. Who knew? <laughs> um, okay, have any of the cities tried the mobility pricing system that you were talking about at Pudo? Mm -hmm. And how do you go about getting the public on board with mobility pricing? This is a really hard sell Absolutely. to the public. Absolutely. That's why you need really good storytellers. You need really good storytellers. Um, it is a really hard sell. Uh, there are some cities um, south of the border. This is the only time I get to say south of the border. It actually means the, the, the U.S. Um, we'll go there in another conversation. But uh, 
there are some cities on the West Coast that are experimenting right now uh, with uh, curb digitization. I know there's some cities in the, in, the, in the central part of the country. Everybody's experimenting right now to see. The first thing is, how do we digitize our curbs? Most city Department of Transport agencies don't actually know what their curbs are being used for. So just getting that digital layer first lets them know who's using it for loading or is it being used for loading or for, for picking up. Unfortunately, we use 99% of our curb space to park privately owned cars. So we're not actually utilizing our public right of way for the public, it's actually for private car owners, which is a skewed form of economics. So that's the first part. And then figuring out how to price it will be the next piece. San Francisco did um, on-street uh, car parking pricing as one of its first forays into the curb management. And it's been a very effective tool at changing behavior. It was very difficult at the time to do congestion pricing in San Francisco, so we did we did uh, parking pricing instead. So whether you charge for the trip at the beginning of the trip or at the end of the trip, as long as you're charging for the trip somewhere is actually the way you should think about this. Okay, here's a question I'm curious about. You know that idea that if you make the speed limit 30 kilometers an hour in cities, it's a lot safer, and some cities have actually tried this, yes. but it's a really hard sell. So if we had a whole fleet of autonomous vehicles, would it be easier to do it because you could just say, well, the robots only go 30 kilometers an hour. Um, like, do you think that those decisions might be easier to kind of just implement and show people? I don't think anything in the public right of way is ever going to be easy. Everything is World War III just because of the nature that everybody's an expert. Um, and so it is what it is. Uh, but I think having informed data and having pilots and trials and showing the causality of that, that change does win hearts and minds. In San Francisco with Vision Zero, we found that using data from hospital records, not just the police records, where the collisions were, 12% of the streets had 75% of the, the, the severe collisions. So it wasn't a citywide issue, it was a very concentrated issue. And the evidence-based uh, changes were not just about uh, enforcement and education, but also engineering. Some streets were actually designed so you couldn't physically drive more than 30 kilometers an hour. And that was, a, that was a hard decision we made, but it was required because it was such a high injury corridor. So it's a bit of both. It's a bit of the, the data and the education, but also the trialing and trying things out. And then if you had a full fleet of AVs, they follow the, the letter of the law. So they'll do what they're told. In Arizona and Phoenix, uh, in school zones, they're limited to, to about 25 kilometers per hour. I think it's 20 kilometers per hour. And the Waymo vehicle slows right down based on what the letter of the law says, because whatever you write in law is just uploaded into the algorithm and says, oh, I'm physically here now for the next 500 meters, I go 20 kilometers an hour, and I go into the school, pick up the kids, and then take them off. And the parents were screaming because they were causing long lines and cues and saying, what are you doing, what are you doing? After a couple of weeks, so the kids were like, you know what, mom, you need to drive more like Waymo, because that, they actually look out, look out for us. I don't think you guys look out for us. So um, it can change behavior very quickly. Okay. Oh, I like both of these. Which one should I? Okay, we'll do Ask one and then the other. Um, how do we implement a smart transportation system without gentrifying neighborhoods? Really hard question. So uh, it's not as easy as it sounds, and it's not about the transportation. It's about what are we doing with the rest of our economy in our region? What are we doing with the housing supply? Where are the jobs? How do we make the jobs actually work for everybody? And then how do they get to and from those places? If there's a way to... We've tried inclusionary zoning, we've tried affordable housing uh, minimums. Most of the, if we can remove the car parking requirements, those houses can become more affordable, we can actually add more capacity, that's one way to do it. But then it's more about how do we actually utilize the street and the streetscape. It's very difficult to keep certain mom and pop stores in business if their business model is no longer up to date with the way that the world actually works and interacts. Having said that though, there are ways to actually work with certain businesses and actually make sure that they actually get to stay in place. I don't have all the solutions. We've, done, we've tried a lot of things in San Francisco. Some things have worked, some things haven't worked. Then we have this national issue in the US where we don't have good healthcare. Um, that's the understatement of this conversation. Um, <laughs> we have high priced housing. We have uh, baby boomer NIMBYs that don't want any more density in their neighborhoods, causing prices to go through the roof. And what that means is that we have a massive housing shortage and people are getting evicted on the street. No bike lane upgrade is going to take care of that problem, right? This is a fundamental housing supply uh, local economy issue. So you need to bring those factors in and then figure out can transport actually help with that. Okay, and the other question I really liked was how will AVs interact with jaywalkers? Yes. 
So the word jaywalkers is a really bad word because if you've done your history, it was invented by the car companies to make sure that people behaved on the road. And we used to own all the street as people. We could walk anywhere we wanted, do anything we wanted, and cars had to basically maneuver through us. They didn't like that, so they created this rule of jaywalking and created the crosswalk. They forced us all into the intersection, which is the most dangerous part of the street for us to be at, and concentrated all of us to be there. So, sorry question, don't buy the jaywalking argument. AVs are going to be very polite, they're going to do what they're told, and people have to figure out how they're going to interact with them, because they will never do things that they're not programmed to do. If we decide that that's actually inconvenient, we're going to program the AV vehicles to act more like the vehicles today and to be a little bit more risky. I personally hope we never get there because I'd rather we actually focus on changing our own behavior and actually following a more uh, inclusive uh, uh, public space environment. Do you take into account the induced demand as a result of providing mo mobility to all people such as kids and elderly people who don't drive currently? Okay, I think what this, what this is, getting, is getting at is that people who don't normally drive or like get on the bus by themselves, more people would be moving around and in, under this system. So how would you accommodate that increased pressure? So again, I think it's a, it's a bit of a weird question. Um, do we want elderly people to be isolated and stuck in their places and increase their kind of generally deterioration? No. We want them to be more active, more mobile. If they can become more mobile, more active, they become more socially inclusive, they become happier, they become healthier. That's a really strange question. Um, for children as well, if, if they can be more uh, independent, they feel so much better as kids. They can make more cognitive decisions. If they can ride a bicycle, if we make our streets safe enough that an eight or a 12 year old child can navigate the street on their own, that's how it works in the Netherlands. You want that. You want the children to be more independent. You want uh, senior adults to be more independent. That's a, it's a, it's a, a false, false dichotomy question. Okay, but I do think there's something to the question because... Help me understand the question better. Okay, recently we had this debate, a debate in Vancouver. There was, there's a nonprofit group uh, called All On Board and they're trying to lobby for transit fares to be made on a sliding scale based on incomes and mm -hmm. to make transit free for, for kids under 18. Sure. And so one of the questions that people had was, well, this will make more people drive the bus and that'll actually put strain on our infrastructure, so how we'll have to accommodate for that and that'll be an extra cost. So I think that's where that question was maybe headed. You just start getting into social engineering there, and I think it's just a very slippery slope. So you can not allow them on the transit system, and they'll still get on there, or you can accommodate them and figure out how to make this work better for everybody. OK, do you think that new mobility will mostly provide first, last mile connections, or replace fixed route transit, or both? It depends on the, on the, these are really good questions, by the way. Thank you for these really cool questions. Um, it depends on the environment that it's in. If you have a four or five kilometer bus route that runs every half an hour and an electric bicycle can get you there in a third of the time, guess what's going to happen? No brainer. But if you have a SkyTrain that runs every two minutes and carries hundreds of thousands of people, no bike or e-bike or scooter can ever compete. But why would it? It's, just, it's so much easier just to hop on the, on the system and go. So again, it just depends on what it is and where it is and how it works. First last mile makes a lot of sense but there may be some parallel services that become easy to use with these, with these services. Especially in San Francisco, we found that cross-town transfers are pretty difficult, and a lot of these uh, e-bike share and scooter services actually uh, do a lot of those work for you as well. Okay, um, this is a real policy nerd question. What are the first steps in regulation that our cities need to take, and what are the most important things to regulate and create policy for? Did you see my presentation? I just went through it all. Um, I'm not saying anymore. Basically, it was a create a platform, understand how it works, set some guardrails, figure out the filters, and then start experimenting on the different parameters. You want to switch from being a regulatory authority to being a permissive, performance-based outcomes entity. It's a big shift because the first one says that you know everything, and the word authority is Latin for all-knowing and all-knowledge. And in this world, you don't know it all anymore. The tech companies know more. So you have to bring them in and work on a permissive performance-based structure. Okay, the smart cities and automation plan looks like it's going to displace a lot of jobs, so how do we justify it? So that's still, the jury's out because it's very new. Um, and it's going to take time, it's going to be a transition process. There are certain tasks that we know that automation will actually do and, and will, take, will, will take the role of. It's not clear that they're going to actually take over that 
complete role and how long will that take? So we do have to figure out a transition plan just like we did with um, fossil fuel energy transfer to renewable energy. A lot of governments were behind that. There was a transition plan in place for that. We used to have people deliver uh, milk in milk trucks many, many years ago, and a lot of these even deliver. It's funny, it's all coming back right through Amazon. But those jobs all went away, but there was a transition plan for that. There was the fear about a year ago that this would happen really quickly and happen overnight. It's going to take a decade of transition for this to happen. So if we do know this is going to happen, then we need to start figuring out what are the, what are the transitional roles, what are the tasks, what's the training? Because those data scientists and those uh, urban psychologists and those uh, uh, storytellers are not the same people that are driving uh, a taxi or, or a bus or, or a van right now. It's a very different skill set. You clearly know this. So what's the role to transition them into something else? Um, over time. Okay, this is the last question. It might take you a while to answer it. Though. Okay. What's your utopian future? I just showed you. Um, <laughs> so, the utopian future is where everybody, regardless of background, uh, 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 different uh, abilities and needs, can navigate what they want to do and so they can connect to the people and the moments in their lives and have, do it with joy. If we can bring delight back into our mobility system, if we can bring delight back in our cities, that sense of awe and wonder, no matter what it looks like, that to me is going to be really exciting. And I, I, that's my utopia. OK, thank you so much, Tim. Um, OK, so we're done, and, but we have the room until 8. Everyone is encouraged to stay and network and talk to each other. Don't be on your phones the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Thank and you, thank you, Tim. Thank you.